This Week in Microbiology is brought to you by the American Society for Microbiology at microbeworld.org slash twim. This Week in Microbiology, episode number 44, recorded on October 18th, 2012. Hi, everyone. I'm Vincent Racaniello, and you're listening to TWIM, the podcast that explores unseen life on Earth. This Week in Microbiology is sponsored by ASM, the American Society for Microbiology, the world's largest membership society for microbiologists. Find out how ASM membership can help advance your science, your career, and your network. Go to asm.org slash advance. Joining me today from Small Things Considered, Elio Schechter. Well, hello. How are you? It seems like uh, it's been a long time, but it's only been two weeks. It's true, but it's, you know, time flies. It does cetera. fly. Everything well in San Diego? Yeah, all right, everything's fine. Enjoying the weather. And, the last time yeah. we recorded, you were about to take a car trip with Stan Malloy. How did that go? Oh, well, we were in Mexico at a meeting of an institution called CCC, which stands for various things in Spanish. It's a magnificent, first-rate, world-class institute devoted to marine biology, microbiology, etc. And they had sort of a party for themselves, celebrating some kind of a anniversary. And they asked, actually, they have a, a deal with... San Diego State University, where Stanley Malloy is Dean of Science. And so eight of us from San Diego State went there, and three of us gave talks, and the other three p talks were by people from the institution. Nice. And I got to speak in Spanish, which, is, which I can do and which I enjoyed. <laughs> so a good time was had by all. Excellent. Also joining us today from Medical University of South Carolina, Michael Schmidt. Hello, everyone. How are you? We are fine, and we understand you're jet lagged. Yeah, I, I too had a road trip, but unfortunately, I could not go by car. I had to go by plane. So I went off to Zagreb, Croatia for the 12th Congress of the International Federation of Infection Control. <laughs> and it was a really um, interesting meeting. I uh, learned all the trends that are going on globally with uh, infection control trends and what's working, what's not, and the importance of all sorts of things. So I'll have a little report once my jet lag wears off and on, nice. the on the next episode. That sounds Love wonderful. To about it. I met a person who knows you, Michael. Well, I guess everyone knows you, right? So, uh, I guess. Absolutely. Yeah, I, met absolutely. A guy, I was at a meeting at Banbury out in Long Island. It was a chronic fatigue syndrome meeting. And this fellow is from Wisconsin, near Madison. He works for an institute, which I've forgotten. He does, he does basically metagenomics of microbial communities. And he knew you, but I can't remember his name. <laughs> well. He says, I know Michael very well. Okay. Well, so, that's he's, good. He's basically sequencing the microbiome, the gut microbiome of people with chronic fatigue syndrome to see if there is anything unusual there. Well, you know, that's a beautiful segue into our first paper here because I think he will be able to take many very important lessons from the paper we're going to talk about that just came out um, literally last week. And the title of the paper is Nurture Trump's Nature in a Longitudinal Survey of Salivary Bacterial Communities in Twins from Early Adolescence to Early Adulthood. Hey, and Michael? Yes, what does longitudinal mean? Uh, over time. <laughs> so over time, it can be, is it back in time or ahead in time? It's That's throughout time, I guess. <laughs> okay, I just want... I, I, I guess it's throughout time. It's like longitude. So it's from it's, one time to another, not in any given time point, in other words, right? Yeah. All right. Just and... Me. and. Um, it's by uh, Star Ringer, Clemente Corley, Hewitt, Knights with an S, Walters, Knight without an S, and Crowder of the University of Colorado at Boulder. And this is truly an interdisciplinary 
team of folks from the Department of Chemistry and Biochemistry, Molecular, Cellular, and Developmental Biology, Behavioral Genetics, Computer Science, and uh, it's really a collaborative effort and I think points to a trend of how uh, microbiologists really need to talk to their colleagues in order to get a really neat piece of science done. And the title says it all. And I think the author should be commended for first giving us a title that uh -huh. you know, piques your attention and really drives home the conclusion of the paper in the title. And, you know, I, I was a little jet lagged when uh, I got the paper from um, Vincent. And, you know, when you're a little jet lagged and you, you have to rethink, you really appreciate the value of good authorship. And, sure. and, and these authors really did a bang up job. And I commend this paper to you because they lay it out in a really nice way. They, this paper asks three questions. The first one is what is the intra and inter individual variation of the oral microbiome in a large geographically defined cohort. And Vincent brought up to me, he said, this is, this is a study in the value of the being the pack rat, saving stuff. <laughs> because what these folks had in their collection is they had samples. And as many of us uh, know, this is salivary samples. So we all know what they had in their freezer, good old spit. And, uh, so that, that was the first question. What is the, the variation be within individuals and between individuals? The second question, and I think this goes to our friend in the, the chronic fatigue study as well, is the composition of the human microbiome inherited. Do you, do you get it? And they, they, they were so lucky, and they had the, in the fact that they had monozygous twins – twins, you know, individuals from the same egg, and this, they also had dizygotic twins uh, uh, from a different egg. And the third question that they asked is, and this is my phrase, not theirs, does our microbiome grow with us? Or what their question was is, what are the changes of the salivary microbiome during the decade spanning adolescence? Now, Think about what we all did during our adolescence. We we let's not. Let's not. <laughs> <laughs> we, 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 uh, we, we uh, you know, in the salivary world, we're, we're thinking about, you know, bringing in new actors and, you know, we're exploring our, our sexuality and uh, interacting and uh, eating different foods and all sorts of things. So, that this paper is is really neat and how they ask these three questions to get at in the the conclusion of their paper isn't effectively buried in their in their title. So let's go to question number one. Let me ask let me point out something, sure. Michael. This is amazing. From nineteen ninety seven to the present, they had people give them spit. It's just amazing. They they thought way back then they wanted to do something. And now they have finally been able to do it. I, I just find that really remarkable that someone had the foresight to say, let's collect spit for a long time and, and look at the microbiome. Be careful how you say foresight, because the Foresight Institute at, at Harvard is a major place for the research on the subject. Really? You're collecting. Of spit. Oh, yeah. Sorry about that. <laughs> the other thing I wanted to point out, which is cool, they didn't eat for two hours, and then they washed their mouth out with scope. And then they collected the scope, and that's what they used for DNA. How cool is that? You know, the composition of scope has changed with time. It used to have alcohol in it, and now some versions don't. Really? So, so hopefully they use the same. I think scope has alcohol. I'll have to check. Um, now that I said that, I don't know for certain. Some of them do, and some of them don't. You know, it's interesting, though, that that makes it consistent because it, I first, when I first saw the title, I said, ah, oh, people are spitting into a tube, but this way you rinse the whole mouth out, right? So you get yeah. a little more consistent sampling. Yes. Mm. So looking at their first question, they, they had 264 
individual saliva samples from 107 individuals between 8 and 26 years of age. Their average age was, was 16. And the reason they go into the demographic is so that you have an understanding of what's actually going into their mix. They also give you the further demographic on, you know, how many were white, how many were Hispanic, et cetera. And the way they ascertained uh, the intra being between the same individual, that is, if I gave a spit sample and then 10 years later I gave a spit sample, they would look to see if my oral flora had changed. And then between, say, for instance, myself and my brother. So the way they did this is with um, PCR amplification and subsequent pyro, 454 pyrosequencing of the 16S ribosomal um, DNA gene of the hypervariable region V1 and V2. The, the reason you tell us which region of the 16S gene they sequenced is because some hypervariable regions are better for pulling out um, specific types of microbes mm. are others. And so they actually um, used the hypervariable region for the community that they were going after, specifically the oral cavity. In the, the gut, people often use uh, V6, V6 to V7, if I'm remembering properly. And if I'm not, then I'm sure I'll get letters. <laughs> uh, so what they learned is, um, and when you begin to look at their figures, um, this, their, their paper is, is really nice in that figure 1A uses a uh, box or box whisker plot. And a whisker plot is just as you would think it would be, you know, a lot of hair in the middle and then, you know, the curvy ends of the mustache going up. And it gives you an idea of the variability of, of the samples. And what they learned is the relative abundance of each phylum that they found was highly variable between sampling to find the core genus level salivary microbes based on the percentage. And what they learned is that eight genera were observed in greater than 95% of all samples. And this is again... Actually, but that in itself is not that surprising because about 50% of the salivary bacteria can be cultivated. So this had been known from... Much of it had been known, let's say, but that's fine because they, obviously the longitudinal studies what's what's what the point of this paper is. And um, the eight genera that they found is they found the usual suspects that exactly. Would, and if you ask the average general student which likely genus you would find, and they would immediately tell you Streptococcus, and that was one of the major ones. Vianella is another; it's a gram-negative coccus. Gemella. Granula catella, the Neisseria, uh, the Bacteroides, the Prevotella, the Actinobacter, which is in the Rothia. And they also found some Fusobacterium, TM7, a Cyanobacter, Spirochetes, and Tenorchutes. And so when you look at their box plot in, in figure one, you, you look at the relative abundance and, and you begin to uh, marvel at the amount of work that was done, but figure two, I think, is the testament of how easily you can digest sequence information, and this is a gem. Figure I think two. You're right. I've never seen anything quite like it, and it caught my eye, and I said, "Gee, I get it." Mm -hmm. it's nice. Figure two is just wonderful because it tells us that for. 95 to 100 percent of the samples that they checked, they found Fusobacterium, Neisseria, Rothia, Prevotella, Streptococcus, Vianella, and it and it tells you what family they are in, whether they're Firmicutes or whether they're in their Bacteroides. It's really an elegant fil 
uh, figure. And as you move out in the circle, the percentage that they found uh, the various microbes uh, drops off. And it was so digestible that you could immediately understand the complexity of what you were seeing, whether or not someone was a, a rare event. Uh, one of the rare events that they saw in 0.4 to 5 4.9% of the population was Pseudomonas. I wouldn't normally consider Pseudomonas a normal flora organism in the oral cavity, yet here it is. In some Pseud people, in like 5% of people, right? Yeah. And Propionibacteria is there too. Well, Propionibacterium, I, I didn't think it's all like that unusual since it's, you know, the 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 you know, the skin and the mm. nose are connected. And, you know, from our discussions of uh, the last time, propionobacterium being on the face, you would expect, you know, some people yeah, to sure. move them through. But the one that I found that was really remarkable was Brady rhizobium. Who would have yeah. thought a Brady rhizobium would be in um, the oral cavity? So this so, is something normally on roots? Yeah. Maybe they just ate something that... <laughs> <laughs> <With roots. laughs> it could be, well, but also it could be that the genus has uh, you know things which are not what we normally think of as yeah. as uh, Brady bacteria. You know, the taxonomy is that way after all. Yeah. I just don't know. We have to we have to look. They they also are, are good, and they help the reader appreciate uh, what these operational taxonomic units um, mean and. They, they found at a 97% identity, they found two um, OTUs as they're abbreviated, OTU1 and OTU578. The stands for o Operational Taxonomic Unit, right? OTU. And it's generally a 97% uh, sequence similarity that puts you into one versus another OTU. And OTU1 was just as any good dentist will tell us. It was Streptococcus mitis, and it's the second most common bacterium isolated from the oral cavity, I think after strep mutans, uh, by molecular cl cloning. And the other one has not yet, uh, they weren't able to identify its species. So my suspicion is this is one of the 50% of the microbes of the oral cavity that has not yet been hmm. Elevated. So that's not all that surprising either. There, you know, there's some things we just don't know what to feed them, and uh, or how to plate them, or what micro environment uh, to give them, or so what neighbors they need. What neighbors they along with, because it's cross feed. Right. So that takes care of question one for us, and it really shows that the diversity was, yeah, we sort of expected what we found, and it was um, really nice, but figure two is the gem, and if if, if you ha have an opportunity to look at this paper, just take a look at, at figure two. It's deceptively simple. I mean, this is the beauty of it. A casual reader may say, so so what? So they, they drew a bunch of circles, but in reality, this is innovative, and it's clever. Mm -hmm. It may not be apparent, but Take, take it for us. Take it from us. It's good stuff. The second question that they ask next is: Is the composition of the mic of the human uh, microbiome heritable, specifically the of the oral cavity? And they looked at the saliva from monozygotic and dizygotic twins. And again, this is again their foresight of you know you you have a uh, practice in which you can uh, recover. Uh, a sample from this very unique population. If you had to go out and recruit the numbers that they had, they had 27 pairs of monozygotic twins and 18 pairs of dizygotic twins. So that's 46 and 36 individuals respectively. And then for good measure, they had un eight unrelated sibling pairs uh, that they um, go into. They analyze things, again, using the same methodology and here, here's their conclusion. Although there was a trend toward a higher similarity among monozygotic twin pairs, the similarity was not statistically significant. Hmm. So then this suggests that 
you know, in, in monozygotic twins, because they, they literally are genetically identical, this suggests that the overall genetic makeup of the host has little or no apparent role in the time that they were sampling, mm-hmm. age 12 to 24. Mm-hmm. And this is where they're measuring it by the unweighted unifrac distance. So I started reading up on Unifrac and, and got a headache, but um, I put a reference <laughs> I don't blame you, by the way. <laughs> put a reference into the show notes associating the microbiome composition with environmental covariates using generalized Unifrac distances. And this is a interesting statistical treatment of how Univac needs to be think, thought about, and I think um, once I have more time to digest it, it it may be commonplace in my understanding. But you know, they they this is their their figure three and their figure four. Where they present their unweighted distribution with the unifract differences, and looking at figure three and looking at Figure three is com- looking at the genetic effect of the salivary microbiome at ages 12, 17, and 22 years of age. Um, and you can see that it doesn't change over time in the monozygotic twins. It doesn't change over time in the dizygotic twins. In the random same-aged persons, uh, it doesn't change over time. When you compare and contrast the uh, groups amongst themselves, that's where my statistics, I I really have to do a little bit more reading in order to uh, appreciate the the wonder uh, of their particular figure. But what their take-home message from uh, figure three is, is that the environment has a higher impact on the overall composition of the microbiome which goes to the first word in their title, yep. nurture. Nurture is, is the, the driving force. And then the third question that they begin to take us through is what are the changes of the salivary microbiome during this mystical decade where you go from being a child, puberty happens, and we know that Puberty is is a remarkable event. There's rapid growth spurts. There's massive hormonal changes. Uh, from our discussion of last week or last time, we know that uh, in adolescence we hypersecrete oils, making uh, the microbiome of the face grow propionobacterium. And we talked about you know the phage and that issue. And so, looking at this. Third question, what are the changes in the cell of the microbiome during the decades spanning as an adolescence? And then, for good measure, they throw in looking at weight and gender on the oral microbial community composition. And again, using the same methodology, using uh, saliva samples that they had saved, using the 454 sequencing, looking and comparing via this unifrac analysis they they understand that the oral microbiome isn't really changing all that much during this remarkable period and they're arguing for a broad sampling of humans of different ages and lifestyles for these microbiome studies, especially when we begin to ask questions about specific diseases. And uh, many of us have been watching the literature about the emergence of the microbiome and chronic things like diabetes and obesity. And the folks at Washington uh, University in St. Louis have been the pioneers in looking at the microbiome and obesity. And they didn't, in this particular study, find anything different based on weight and gender between the two groups, uh, or three groups, uh, the gender, the weight, and the oral microbiome. So 
The question is, is 107 enough? So what do you think? What's the answer? Uh, the answer is, I think I need to learn more about the statistics. <laughs> yeah, you're copping out, man. Hey. Well, I, I've learned. Otherwise, I get letters. You know, I, based <laughs> on the gut microbiome, right, they did initial sampling. They made a conclusion that there are three enterotypes. And now as they sequence more, they say, well, it's not as clear cut, right? So yes. I would guess that if you look at more spit samples, it'll the edges will get fuzzier, too. Well, I, I I was blown away by figure two, and I, I think um, it it was really a nice paper to read to really put into perspective how I think the microbiome literature is becoming more approachable for people not in the field. Yeah, and I yeah. commend these authors for their approach. Yeah. And this Great. was in yeah. genome research. Yeah. yeah, interesting, interesting journal for that. Uh, by the way, there is a general worry that I think we all should have when it comes to metagenomic studies of environmental samples, and that is that this does not distinguish between live and dead bacteria. Yeah. In other words, bacteria could be there dead as a doornail, and they would register because the DNA is still intact enough. So, uh, you know, it seems to me that all these studies should be accompanied with, at least when you can, which you can in this case, with a little bit of culture work. Yeah, yeah. Uh, it, it's not a virtue to say that something in the study was culture independent. They make it sound like it's a good thing. Well, it's a necessity. <laughs> it's not necessarily a good thing. So a little bit of culturing, I think, would go a long ways towards validating these results. Yeah. Well, I want to get your take on the new flavors of PCR that can detect, quote unquote, viable DNA, where you add a uh, redox dependent dye that translocates mm. across dead cells and then makes the DNA inside the dead cell non PCRable. Huh. And. S and the lot that that was um, a fa a favorite poster at last year's ICAC. Many of the people are beginning to investigate these redox sensitive dyes that effectively are asking the question: Is the bacterium live or dead based on an energized membrane? Well, but I agree. Yeah. Again, again, you could probably have what what would register as dead and still be alive and resuscitable. So you know, it's not perfect. It's it's a it's a good step. I'm I'm sure of that, but. Defining dead and alive certainly is elusive unless you do cultures. You know, no, so I, it's, I it's, am of the old school. The operational definition is the ability to form a colony on a plate. Right. right so basically exactly. here in this, uh, in this sample in Colorado, um, you get your oral bacteria in your family, probably mostly from your mother, but your family members. And then they're pretty constant through puberty. And that's different from the guy next door. It's it's different because they're they're having a different seating when when the babies are born. That's, that's basically it, right? You're, yours yes. is constant, but you're different from somebody else's. Yes. To each his own. To each his own spit. <laughs> Sum quique. That's a Latin <laughs> saying. Yeah. It means to each his own. They had that on a bar in Boston <laughs> called Jake Words. To each his own quick way. Yeah, we had that on one of our episodes. Well, remember. maybe that should be the title of this podcast. To each his own spit. <laughs> yeah, well, I mean, that could be a good title for the episode because in this next paper, it, you know, the prophage is, to, is pretty unique as well. What a good segue, Michael. I try. The next paper is a cell paper called Prophage Excision Activates Listeria Competence Genes That Promote Phagosomal Escape and Virulence. This is just wonderful, Elio. It's a nice paper. It's a nice paper. So uh, it's about listeria, and listeria is a very interesting and somewhat odd organism. Gram positive in the firmicutes, that is mm -hmm. in the same group as bacillus and clostridium and streptococcus and staphylococcus, but it's a little bit off on the side. And it does cause foodborne uh, disease. And some of this is serious, serious to the extent that there are uh, outbreaks which result in a significant number of cases. There was an outbreak due to the consumption of contaminated cantaloupe. You wouldn't expect cantaloupes to be so contaminated, but of course, if you wash them in dirty water, they're going to get the bugs. This uh, led to a... Um, 
a number of cases. I think there were some uh, 147 cases and 33 deaths. The reason for the deaths is that hmm. although this is not a terrible bug in the normally healthy immunocompetent people, it does affect immune-compromised people, like pre and including pregnant women and newborns and people with chemotherapy, and of course, what concerns me most, the elderly. <laughs> so anyhow. I once heard Dan Portnoy say, and he works on this bug, he said, uh, usually listeria, uh, you won't die from it, but you wish you were. <laughs> I guess so, yeah. Because I guess you feel badly. Gastroenteritis and so forth. But in rare cases, when it causes death, it, uh, it goes into the bloodstream and causes both sepsis and meningitis. So it's not no fun. So um, do you want to say something more epidemiological, Michael? Or you're up on these things. Uh, the the only thing is, is it it's a companion of prepared foods and meats. And if you recall from our last episode of of last time on on the phage. There are companies out there that are using phage specific to listeria, which yeah, I think right. is That's important. Right. That's right. That's which I right. think is important for our virulence story here. It could be. In fact, it, yeah, because we're going to talk about phages in a moment. That's very good. I'm glad you brought it up. So anyhow, listeria has a lifestyle which is not unique, but only shared by a few bacteria. Namely, it gets taken up by epithelial cells, macrophages, and a few other cells. And, of course, it's taken up into a vesicle called a phagosome. Just an imagination of the cell membrane with a bug inside of it. Now, phagosomes are not a good place for most bacteria because they tend to attract lysosomes, which are bags of enzymes, which fuse with them and release the enzymes into, the, into this compartment where the poor bacteria are now going to be chewed up. So, getting out of a phagosome is one strategy. Other bacteria have different strategies. It's not the only one. So, uh, as discovered by Daniel Portnoy, whose name you mentioned, uh, the, uh, these organisms have the ability to travel across the membrane of the phagosome into the cytoplasm of the host cell, where, by the way, they do other magic. They recruit actin tails on one end, and the actin tail by polymerizing and depolymerizing pushes them along at great speeds. Something I think we mentioned once, but we could revisit because it's a lovely story. Never mind that. Let's go back. Exiting from the um, from the phagosome is a complicated business. Uh, Portnoy et al. discovered that there is a, uh, a an enzyme called listeriolysin and some phospholipases, which apparently damage the, the membrane of the phagosome. Mm -hmm. But there's more to it. And uh, what these authors found, they are located in uh, Tel Aviv University and uh, Hadassah Medical School. What they found is that they were doing some essentially genomics on listeria and playing around with it. And they found that there is a set of three operons which are homologous to three operons in bacillus, another gram positive, where they are involved in the phenomenon called competence. Competence is what allows bacteria like Bacillus subtilis, pneumococcus, and a few others to take up DNA spontaneously without having to be zapped with electricity or anything like that, and uh, therefore become transformed, gen genetically transformed. Um, this is the old story, dating down back to 1928 when uh, Griffith, uh, who was it? Not Griffith. Griffith, yeah. Griffith, Discovered yes. Yep, transformation in pneumococcus. Anyhow, listeria does not care, is not transformable. Mm -hmm. So it has these homologous genes called a COM, C O M for competence, operons, three operons. And so what are they doing there? Well, it turns out that these genes are involved in the escape of the listeria from the phagocytic vesicle into the cytoplasm. Just how that works, nobody quite knows, and what, how it works in connection with the other enzymes known to be made by listeria, like, like listeria lysine and others, is not known either. But here is the story, that we have a case of, I suppose you could call it, divergent evolution. You have two sets of um, bugs, two bugs that have a similar uh, genetic makeup, that is they carry three operons for totally different purposes. So 
it's like, it's a really interesting story because if you see it that way, this tells you a lot about evolution. I would reckon, the authors don't go into this, but I would reckon that maybe these two uh, sets of operons are derived from a common ancestor. And for all we know, the common ancestor, a bacterium a billion years ago, may have developed that for yet another purpose. So this is appropriating whole genetic systems for different purposes. And I find that that says a lot about evolution. We've, we've mentioned how evolution probably tends to be modular. And so these, it's entirely possible that you could even transfer these laterally by horizontal gene transfer, whatever. Anyhow. Hey, Elio, the uptake of DNA is probably important for evolution of bacteria, right? And it probably pre precedes uh, survival in a macrophage. Happened much later when protists came up in the world. So, so Listeria doesn't care to take up foreign DNA then, apparently? Most bacteria don't. I and see. the reason is that they don't like to have foreign DNA mucking up their genome. Hmm. I mean, most DNA taken up, if it were to be integrated, would be insertion mutations of some sort. So um, it's, not, it's, it's rather few bugs that are spontaneously transformable. Hmm. So, so yeah. Elio, when you make bacteria competent in the lab by chemical or electronic treatment, what are you actually doing? You're permeabilizing the, the membrane? You're doing that. That's exactly. Okay, so you're not turning on this calm locus at all because most bacteria don't even have the whole thing, right? Exactly. So it's rare to find it in a non-transformable bacterium, and here you have Okay. On the other hand, this has nothing to do with competence. And in a way, let me, let me sort of exp tell you what I went through. When I read the article, and the article has, an, for its title, it has uh, Listeria competence genes. And I got confused because then they go on and say this has nothing to do with competence. Right. Well, <laughs> this, is, this is the opposite of a good title, sort of, kind of. That's right. It didn't serve me because I was looking for why do they call it competence when it's got nothing to do with competence? Well, because some another system had appropriated the term. But, and it tells you that there's a danger, and this is, comes up repeatedly, there's a danger in naming things prematurely. Well, you know, Elia, they call it, they say the DNA competence system of Listeria is non-functional. Yeah. So it's not a competence yeah. system. Yeah. <laughs> Anyhow, I'm 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 being picky. This is nothing to do with the merit of the paper. This is just that it took me a while to get out of the competence mode <laughs> and realize that we're talking about something completely different. So here's the story in brief. The um, they find that the genes encoded by these three operons. Oh, and by the way, I should mention that they lack some of the genes which in Bacillus subtilis are required for DNA uptake. So that's why they're not competent. Mm -hmm. They don't have the system. Mm -hmm. Anyhow, the, of the remaining genes, these are turned on and turned on to a very high level when the cells infect the macrophage. Okay? In a macrophage, you find them turned on. In broth, in the lab, they're not turned on. Okay? So what gives? Well, what gives is that uh, and of these genes, apparently, uh, these genes are involved in the escape from the phagosomal vesicle into the cytoplasm. Right. How they work, we don't know. There are two genes which are involved. One codes for a pseudopilus. I had to look that up. I wasn't sure what a pseudopilus is. It's a structure which is used for what's called type 2 protein secretion systems. It's a structure that looks like a pillus that is a protein hair sticking out of the cells and which is involved in secretion of proteins, just like regular pilluses are in another system. So they make the pseudopillus and they make also a, uh, another protein uh, which is uh, involved in um, making a transmembrane channel. Apparently these two, I'm not sure they're sufficient. They may be sufficient for the transfer of the bacteria, for the exit of the bacteria from the phagosome. So why they have the other genes and why the, uh, for the, uh, the other calm genes and why they are turned on is not clear at all. We don't know. So there's a lot we don't know yet. But here is the story then in brief. Uh, Listeria gets into a cell, gets into a phagosome. It activates a system, this calm system, the COM system produces at least two proteins, which are uh, required apparently for yeah required for exit from the 
from the um, vesicle. They're not enough, they're not sufficient, but they are required. Now, the story gets better because the question becomes, why is this, what's this activation all about? Well, it turns out that these three operons, these three COM operons in Listeria have a common regulatory protein called COMK. Okay? This is the only one there, which is strange because in Bacillus, there are quite a few regulatory proteins. I, I didn't look up how many, but it's certainly more than one. So COMK is a regulator which is required for the expression of all these genes. It's a busy protein. Anyhow, it's a transcription, transcription activator of three different operons. All right, so there it goes. It, you need COMK. COMK allows the production of these other two proteins, the pseudopillus. Well, pseudopillus is a collection of proteins and this transmembrane, transmembrane channel protein. Okay, now what makes it turn on? What makes it turned on is the fact that in regularly growing listeria in the lab, the COMK gene, the gene for the regulator, is interrupted by an insertion of a prophage. It's an insertion mutation. There's a prophage that goes and sits in the, somewhere in the middle of this gene, separates the two halves. When they get transcribed, there is no messenger RNA corresponding to that gene. It's silent. For reasons unknown, in the milieu of the vesicle, this prophage gets activated, gets excised, just like prophages are one to do. When the prophage comes out, it probably does by a regular, uh, the, the regular sort of Campbell model process, I would think. When it gets excised, the two ends of the gene in question are now united. And now you have an entire gene which can be transcribed into the proper messenger RNA, which makes the proper proteins. So that's it. That's pretty much the story. So. It involves uh, really a number of players, and it's surprising. Well, let me tell you one, one other thing. You may, uh, if you're really up on things, and I bet you that Michael is, uh, you may have heard of an analogous situation in Bacillus, where a sigma factor is also a gene for a sigma factor is interrupted by a prophage, and a similar story in the pneumococcus, also with the work of Ju uh, uh, June Scott. Mm -hmm. so, but you've heard of that. Imagine. If you haven't, let me tell you that this is not a unique situation, the prophage excision as a gene regulation for gene expression mechanism. However, there's something odd here. The, in, the, in the other cases, in bacillus and in pneumococcus, the prophage is defective. In fact, it probably corresponds to a cryptic phage or remnants of a phage. Here, in other situations, you can show that this prophage corresponds to a really live virus, a lytic virus both lytic and lysogenic. So, but what's interesting here is that upon excision, the virus doesn't kill the cell. That's right. This is weird because the virus does not progress. The, it, you would think that the, when it excises, it excises the proper genome mm -hmm. for making a virus. And uh, it, it just doesn't. So here's another mystery. Why not? And the guess is that there's something in that environment which keeps it, keeps it from doing it. It's not to the advantage of listeria to get killed upon excision of the prophage. It's yeah. to the advantage of listeria not to have that happen. So there must be some regulatory mechanism, and this is fascinating. Now, Elia, why do you have to have the prophage there in the first place? Why not just keep it out and listeria always makes this protein? Well... Uh, I suspect that that protein may not be good for business in other situations. Mm. I mean, I, it's, it's, it's a very good question, but you don't want to make... Uh, the, the proteins that you're making, the pseudopillars and the other proteins, um, may be damaging to, to the bacteria growing outside of cells. I don't know. So you could make a strain without the prophage and with no attachment site so the prophage can't go in, right? And then see how it grows if there's some problem with it? I mean, that's true, and I don't think that's been done. So I can't answer the question. Yeah. Because I, I, I look at it as um, Mother Nature has optimized Listeria for really being an ideal intracellular parasite. And it's one of these facultative intracellular parasites. And the interesting thing here is it, mean, so it, it, it... It's colonies. Yeah. It reminds me of... Um, it may be able to sense its place. 
and in how the promoter element is reacting to the environmental cues we don't we we don't know how it's actually being how the signals are being actually transmitted to this genetic element to effectively trigger it per se and that's the hallmark of, of the of the bacillus with the uh, sigma story and in with in the pneumococcus as well because it's looking for um, you know the the max just before maximum stationary phase is when the pneumococci become quote naturally competent unquote uh, and so it it almost is reminiscent if you will of E. coli and the very simple system of um, the lac operon that is actually controlled by cyclic AMP and specifically interacting with the positive activator. Uh, the CRP protein, the catabolite repressor protein, that then facilitates this. So the question that, as I was reading this, I was wondering, I said, have they uncovered the genetic element that is really the operon that w will find the regulator that will give them the ability to express this, this virulence profile while it's inside the cell, uh, the mon because listeria goes into non-professional um, uh, phagocytic cells, and you know can go into a monocyte, and and so you begin to That's to wonder funny. wonder what what they've stumbled into, and I think they've they've really got a a neat system here to to really help us. The other thing that I think is remarkable in this story is if we begin to explore pathogenicity islands and listeria is a frank pathogen when it gets into the meninges and does all its wonderful things um, and and how this whole paradigm of virulence is is manifested and we we touched on this when we talked about the staphylococci really reacting to the environment that they are in and you know i think many of these papers that we have been selecting that are are really very specific if you step back and ask the question and they ask, place it in in their title they have the word virulence and as more and more people are beginning to sequence lots more uh, uh, bacteria we're, we're going to begin to have to take genomes apart and begin to look at these things and I think this regulatory element and as Elio said um, this is not unique. Bacillus does a variation of this, and um, the pneumococcus does a variation of this. And so the ability to drop something in to change the paradigm of expression because the prophage well, excision. Just, yeah. That's, that's what's different, Michael. Yeah. Uh, know that the operon model works and that it, it really, it, an awful lot of genes are responding to that. The, the, the difference here is that it's a different kind of uh, mechanism for regulation of gene expression by excision of a prophage. So, but you're right. I mean, any time we look at the genome from now on, or for some time now, the, the role of uh, cryptic prophages, phage remnants, and in this case, an entire prophage, has to be analyzed because it all means something. None of those cryptic things are there just for fun. They've been retained for a good reason. Mm. So you're right. I think one has to use, and people will. I don't doubt that this is in the cards, that the gen genome gazing will include this kind of consideration. But in general, I think the paper was very satisfying in describing the phenomenon in terms. It's a very detailed paper, by the way. Uh, and... Um, it, it, it uncovers a, a very nice, lovely phenomenon. And by the way, these, uh, this phage is a member of the Cyphoviridae family. It's a double-stranded DNA phage with a long tail and an isometric head. And it turns out that it's the same kind of phage that we talked about last time, infecting P. acnes, the Cyphoviridae. I would be interested to know if all strains of Listeria have this prophage, or if there are other mechanisms for regulating this COMK gene? 
Good question. That there, there are about eight species, I think, of listeria, and I and one is called innocua, which means uh, to me, in Latin at least, that it's innocuous. But there may be, I think there are others which are pathogenic. Do you know, Michael? Or these There's uh, also listeria ovii that people use as the, <laughs> excuse me, the avirulent flavor mm-hmm. of listeria monocytogeny. So, um, I, I'm sure our friends in the food food industry uh, probably have their strain collections and they could make short work of this with uh, the right set of PCR primers hmm. to answer Vincent's question. Yeah, it is an int- Yeah, I'm sure that people will do this or have done it. So and now that this is published, people will look for this prophage, I think. It should be very interesting. All right, that's great. Thank you, Alio. I would like to read a couple of emails before I do. Just let me uh, point out that the sponsors of this program, the American Society for Microbiology, they are in the process of doing a membership drive. You can find out at asm.org slash advanced. They have a couple of very good deals, especially for students and postdocs. You can get into ASM rather inexpensively. So check that out. I have been a member since I was a graduate student, I joined in 1975, the only society oh that I have continuously been a member of. But, Alio, you've probably been a member longer, right? I've been a member for 60 years. Wow. 1952. That's impressive. And, you- and, I, and I joined in 1982, even though I was a, a graduate student, I was encouraged to join immediately as a full member. Right. I'm, glad, I'm very glad that I am dealing with such youngsters. <laughs> yes. <laughs> I really enjoy uh, being a member of ASM. They have a lot of great meetings and journals and books and all kinds of activities. So if you it's are... It's a community. In a, in a real sense, it's a community. It is. You, you really uh, establish connections and you feel like you're part of something. For example, the three of us have been united hey. through ASM. True. Right? So, yes. Good thing. Check it out, folks. ASM.org slash advance. All right. A couple of emails. This first one, I bet, is right up Michael's alley. It is from Jeff, and he writes, Hi, everyone. I am getting to the part of my micro class where I have students analyze antibiograms and notice the blog pointing to the attached paper. So he has given us a, uh, a paper entitled Ability of an Antibiogram to Predict Pseudomonas susceptibility to targeted antimicrobials based on hospital day of isolation. So he writes, forgive me if this topic has already been covered or commented on, but just in case, take a look. I particularly enjoy data tables showing time to unreliability. And boy, things sure change fast in the ICU. I would be interested to hear a program about the ecology of antibiotic resistance in hospitals, clinics. I can think of reasons why resistance might vary depending on location within a hospital, but not being a clinical person, I have no idea what the real reasons are. Forgive me if this too has already been featured. Teaching five classes and then coming home to two young children keeps me chronically (laughs) behind. Love the program. Thank you so much. Jeff is from Georgia Perimeter College. Uh, Michael, do you know someone who could speak to this? Well, How about Joe? Uh, Joe could speak to this, certainly, but I think this is a plug for our, our next episode uh, coming up, uh, if if I'm remembering properly, when we talk about the clinical microbiology lab, and they're the mm-hmm. ones who generate the antibiogram. And so maybe we wish to um, look at the paper that our listener so uh, generously uh, pointed us to, uh, in infection control and hospital epidemiology, from June of 2012. You're you're very familiar with this problem, right, Michael? Oh yeah, it's 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 the scourge of um, it, it's it's why the infectious disease physician and the clinical microbiologist have to be so well read, and they have to keep their data straight because. The bacteria just change because, yeah. you know, he's absolutely right. It's it's a wonderful ecological question because we're constantly placing selection pressure on the microbes, and um, as Jeff writes, it's 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 a data rich process that you have to look for unreliability. So you got to really look to see how long it's going to hold true. Right. So. 
Well, we might get to it next. So next time we're, we're planning to do a clinical microbiology episode, and uh, we might we might not get to it because there's an awful lot of other stuff. But if oh not, yeah, if not, we'll have Joe come and tell us all about it. Yeah, I'll. I'll Joe is out in uh, Alio's neck of the woods. He's in San Diego, presently at at the Infectious Disease Society of America's meeting. Oh, right. Surprised you're not there, Michael. But I guess you travel enough, right? Uh, I I I ran out of nickels. Good. Uh, <laughs> All right. The next one is from Katie, who writes, "Dear Twim Doctors, thank you so much for your wonderful podcast. I enjoy the entire Twi series, and I am thrilled that I finally have something to contribute." In TWIM 43, a really interesting paper on bacterial cavioli was discussed. While this was amazing work, I do have to point out that being chock full of membrane vesicles is not unheard of in bacteria. The photosynthetic purple non-sulfur bacteria Rhodobacter spheroides forms membrane vesicles in the cytoplasm to house its photosynthetic apparatus. I have attached a paper with EM images showing how full... These bacteria are of vesicles. Beautiful studies by investigators such as Dr. Neil Hunter are beginning to uncover how these vesicles are formed, but there is still a lot that is not understood, including what happens to these vesicles during division. Another uh, photosynthetic purple non-sulfur bacteria, Rhodopseudomonas palustris, doesn't form vesicles, but it does form lamellar membranes in the cytoplasm. If you look at the EM images in the second paper I attached, you can see that they have just a splash of cytoplasm. Considering how crowded the bacterial cytoplasm is already, it is really amazing. Keep up the great work, and I look forward to the next podcast. Well, I must say, <clears throat> that's a very astute and appropriate observation. I think I got carried a little bit away with the paper in saying that this is unique. In reality, it is true that it happens, but it happens in rather, uh, I, don't, I wouldn't call them restricted situations, but um, special situations, let's call them. And um, it's not something that E. coli normally does. So on the other hand, E. coli is not that far from the group of bacteria that were mentioned. So it's, it's, it's an appropriate comment all around. Yeah, thank, thank you. you. Thank you, Katie. The next one is from Ayush, who writes, Hello, Twim team. I enjoy listening to you all every week. I apologize that my comment here is about the not-so-recent Twim number 30 about Burkholderia pseudomalae. Some of you may know that melioidosis was perhaps described, tapanuli fever, as a bioterror agent by Sir Arthur Conan Doyle in The, oh Di God. In the Dying Detective. In this story, oh Sherlock Holmes was sent an unknown bacterium in the mail to get him killed. And he says, here's a paper describing Holmes' encounter with the bioweapon. I did, did you know that, uh, Elio? I no didn't know idea. That. I never heard of this. Oh, I thought Michael would know it. No, I didn't. I didn't. <laughs> I I have to go back and read some more Sherlock Holmes, and oh especially goodness. the dying detective. Oh Tapanuli fever. Well, he said he had sent a paper, but I didn't. I didn't find it. So, I, I, you should send us the we'll paper. Look for that. Please keep up the great work. I would strongly recommend Twim as a must listen for every microbiologist. Thank you very much. Isn't that nice. Next one is from Alice, who writes, Soil bacteria as a source of drug resistance genes. Does this have implications for nosocomial infection via contamination followed by gene swapping? You betcha. <laughs> <laughs> but microbes are, we, we, we just talked about competence before, and you wonder why Mother Nature uh, keeps it in her repertoire. And the answer is, is so that you know, you can survive if you're all of a sudden dropped into a puddle with a microbe that is making antibiotics. And um, mm. you also have the same genes to detoxify the, the, the weapon that you're making. And so if that bacterium dies, coughs up its, its uh, genome to the solution, and you so happen to pick it up, and you're at the edge of the, the death zone, if you will, you can actually... Uh, Become, be able to survive and multiply in a very nutrient-rich environment. So this is what goes on in the hospital all the time and why there's so much horizontal gene transfers rampant in the hospital simply because we're using so much of it and the microbes are adapting very quickly and moving the information amongst themselves. For sure. 
Uh, the next one is from Glenn, who writes, Twim Podcast number 11. I was wondering about the comment that was mentioned about the cutting board being the most dangerous tool in the kitchen. What's the best way to clean a cutting board? Also, if one was to only use a quick frozen chicken and cook it without pre-thawing, will this keep one from acquiring the transfer of microbes from chickens to humans? I am assuming that by cooking all meat, it kills all microbes. Well, it's it's the the cutting board is because it's a surface area issue, and there's so many nooks and crannies. Uh, one of the neat things you can do is if you ever happen across a confocal microscope or a electron microscope, put your <laughs> kitchen cutting board underneath it and be terrorized. Um, using frozen chicken is is really challenging because. Um, it depends on how the heat is applied, and the chicken will thaw from the outside in, and so your chicken will be dry and rubbery on the outside and barely cooked on the inside. And if you're going to cook it so that all the microbes are are dead, um, you really have to hope that wherever that ice crystal has moved, the Campylobacter, the Salmonella, or the E. coli, that... Uh, it has indeed killed it by the time you go after and consume it. Because you, you just got to make certain that the E. coli just doesn't thaw out just before you pop it in your mouth. <laughs> and even though you stick a meat thermometer in, you really got to assume that you're killing out to it, all the log units. To, to, because Campylobacter and some of these virulent salmonella, as, as we are learning only need about 10 organisms to cause frank disease. How do you clean the board, Michael? Hot water and soap? Hot water, soap, and then run it through the dishwasher. Wow. Because the dishwasher, um, you know, you're really driving the soap at it. And then many dishwashers go through a heat phase to dry the glassware, and yeah. they turn on the heat. Is a, is a uh, plastic board better than a wooden board? Depends on its age. And wooden boards, you typically oil, yeah. and again, that is going to uh, slow the penetration of the bacteria into the nooks and crannies. Yeah, our uh, wooden cutting board <laughs> broke the other day, and uh, my wife said, oh, we're going to throw this out. And I said, that's good. It's probably contaminated. <laughs> All right. Well, probably. Surely. Surely. <laughs> Hopefully. <laughs> well, I'm, I'm fine. I haven't been sick in ages. Uh, Glenn has another one. That's our last email. First, I'm really enjoying listening to TWIM. And as a non-scientist, you make the information about the micro world understandable. My question is related to TWIM number 16. I have several health issues that require me to take ibuprofen for pain and inflammation. How much concern should I have about the change of the microbiome in my gut and its ability to function properly? I think we mentioned in that, Michael, the, the impact of ibuprofen, right? I think so. I, I don't remember what episode 16 is off the top of my head, but, you know, ibuprofen is an anti-inflammatory and, you know, whatever it's doing in your, in your gut, the, the human gut is this remarkable immune organ. It's got all those wonderful pyres patches and, and all those things going on. So I, I think the, the, the rule of thumb is ask about the quality of your stool. And, and see whether or not it's, it has changed uh, profoundly over time, because that's probably a relative indicator of how your gut's been functioning. But there are no studies on the effect of ibuprofen no, on, on the, no. the microbiome, right? No, not to my knowledge, but I'm sure someone's looking. Well, Glenn, maybe you want to register for a trial, you know. That's true. <laughs> All right. Thanks, everyone, for your emails. Uh, we love answering them. Right, Alio and Michael? Absolutely. Betcha. Send them to TWIM. Even if we don't know the answer. That's right. <laughs> send them. Send your questions and comments to twim at twiv.tv. You can find this podcast at iTunes, at the Zoom Marketplace, and at microbeworld.org slash twim, where you will also find our show notes as well. And if you do like TWIM and you want to help us out, go over to iTunes and just rate the podcast, give it some stars or a comment, and that helps it to stay very visible uh, in the iTunes directory.
Elio Schechter can be found at his lovely blog, Small Things Considered. Thank you, Elio. My pleasure. My God, it was fun. And Michael Schmidt is back from, where were you, in Croatia? Zagreb, Croatia. Back. Welcome back. And he's now at the Medical University of South Carolina. Thank you, Michael. You're welcome, Vincent. I'm Vincent Racaniello. And you can find me at virology.com. W.S. Many thanks. Biggest, biggest yes. life. Biggest life. <laughs> I would like to thank the American Society of Microbiology for supporting TWIM. And many thanks to Chris Condayan and Ray Ortega. Thanks for listening, everyone. We'll see you next time on This Week in Microbiology. Like granulatella. No, granulicatella. Sounds Italian. It does, doesn't it? Yeah, it sounds like a pasta, like uh, <laughs> caviole. <laughs> even right. even prevotella could be Italian, right? Prevotella, prevotella. Are, are, they, are they named after people? Prevoia. And then you violonella. I, I think there was a violon. Yes, I'm quite sure. Gemella. But that, I don't know. Mm. Very good names. Ella. Do we have a uh, Schecterella? Not yet, not yet. <clears throat> you have nothing named after you? I have nothing named after my, my children. Well, that's good. <laughs> that's the best. That's the best kind. Yeah.